Welcome to Through the Bible, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Spelding. Okay, good to see everybody back. I see you all got your coffee cups and you're emptied and uh, we're ready for another half hour. Again, we like to welcome our guests from out of state. Well, we got Ohio and Indiana and Minnesota, Iowa, and... Uh, I guess that's most of them from out of state today. All right, for those of you out in television, again, we just want to welcome you to an informal Bible study. We uh, don't hone to any denominational lines, and uh, even the things that I learned in my denomination, I've had to lay aside and get back to what the book says, and uh, that's all we ask anybody to do. Don't go by what Les Feldick says. You check it out with the book. Okay, now we're on the but nows, and uh, the last one that we started was with regard to the resurrections. And uh, you want to remember that there's going to be various groups <laughs> resurrected. We had the first fruits back there in Matthew that came out of the grave shortly after the resurrection and comprised what the Old Testament harvest system called first fruits, waving that which was ripening earliest. And then we had the full harvest, which I feel is the rapture of the church, which will be by far the greatest numbers of believers. And now last half hour, I thought I was going to get a little further than I got, but we'll have to just keep continuing. We're going to deal with the rest of the dead, which of course involves the Old Testament and uh, the, uh, the folks before Paul came along which would be Christ's earthly ministry in the early books of Acts. And then we jump on over into the tribulation. There are going to be believers during the tribulation who will lose their life, and they're all going to have to be resurrected. So we put them in the category of the corners and the gleanings. And again, before you start condemning me as being way out in left field, just stop and think from Adam until the flood. How many believers do you think there were? Now, I don't want it in terms of hundreds or thousands, but few or many. Few. Precious few. Because right off the bat, you want to remember, Cain killed Abel, and he took off and built an ungodly civilization. And then when Seth came along, there weren't all that many under that lineage. So by the time of the flood, we you know, have few believers that will need to be resurrected. All right, now let's just go from the flood to the Tower of Babel. How long did Noah's testimony last after the flood? Not long, because 200 years later, when you get to the Tower of Babel, there's nothing in Scripture to indicate that there was as much as one believer left. Nothing. And then from the Tower of Babel till the call of Abraham is probably another 200 years, and how many believers are on the earth at the time of Abraham? None that I'm aware of. And so you have precious few all the way from Adam to Abraham. All right, but now let's go from Abraham all the way on up to the first advent of Christ. How many of the nation of Israel became believers during that 2,000-year uh, period of time? Not many. Not many. Now, one verse I always like to use to back that up. Keep your hand in Daniel because we're going to come right back. But turn all the way back to Isaiah. Chapter 1, and of course Isaiah is one of the major prophets preaching to Israel at about 760, 70 B.C., just a couple hundred years after King David and Solomon reigned. And now look at the spiritual state of Israel. And you know the rest of the world had nothing. And so the only believers that we're going to have to look for a resurrection day are these coming out of the nation of Israel in that 2,000-year period of time. All right, Isaiah 1, verse 9. Isaiah 1, verse 9. And again, you don't have to be a theologian. This is just plain, simple English. Oh, my goodness, I forgot to do my wife's bidding. Pardon me, folks out on the television, this is the beginning of book 68. So if you want one of these programs, just tell the girls when you call you want book 68. And for our Canadian viewers, we're finding that they cannot call in to us on the 800 number, and so they're kind of left destitute without using email or snail mail. So for the benefit of all you Canadians up there, 
use our regular number, the 918-768-3218, and hopefully you'll be able to get a hold of us. Okay, sorry about that, but we're informal. You know that, don't you? We, we don't try to be exact all the time. All right, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. Except, or unless, the Lord of hosts, that's Jehovah, Israel's God. So except the Lord of hosts had left unto us. Now remember, Isaiah is a what? He's a Jew, writing to the nation of Israel. So when he used the term us, who is he confining it to? Well, the nation of Israel. He's not talking to the whole human race. He's talking to Israel. All right, so except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. A very small remnant. We, the nation of Israel, would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. So what spared the nation from going the route of Sodom and Gomorrah? That little, small remnant of believers. Now, let me show you another point. Jeremiah 44. We used this years and years ago, I know, but most people have probably forgotten. Jeremiah 44. Now, Jeremiah writes about 100 years after Isaiah. And the nation of Israel, of course, has been prospering. God has been blessing them. They're about ready to meet their doom when the Babylonians come in. But nevertheless how patiently God dealt with this nation with only a few believers. Now, this is typical of the spiritual climate in Israel. Now, I'm out to prove my point that there were not that many believers all up through the Old Testament, so I can put them in the category of gleanings and corners. There weren't that many. Okay, Jeremiah 44. Come all the way down to verse 15. Now this is just to show you the spiritual climate in Israel. Jeremiah 44, verse 15. Then all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense to other gods. Well, they knew all about it. What'd they do about it? Nothing. They were no better. They didn't put up an argument to the women and say, don't do such things. All right. And so all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of Jehovah, we will not hearken or listen unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the queen of heaven. See, that was one of the pagan goddesses, remember. And to pour out drink offerings unto her. As we have done, we and our fathers, our kings, our princes. See that the whole nation had now gone under abject idolatry, except that little tiny remnant. And then they go on to say all the good things that they thought they were gaining from their worship of these pagan gods and goddesses. Well, anyway, I hope I'm making my point that from the time of Adam until we get to the Apostle Paul, there were precious few believers. And so I can delegate them to the corners and the gleanings. Follow me? Okay, now let's come back to Daniel then, chapter 12, and we're going to see the resurrection of all the people now that will be in that gleanings and corners. Daniel chapter 12, and we'll read verse 1 once again, even though we did it in the last half hour. At that time, that is at the end of the tribulation, and we're ready for the resurrection of these Old Testament and tribulation believers. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince who stands for the children of thy people, the nation of Israel, and there shall be a time of trouble. You remember I looked last program where Jeremiah called it Jacob's trouble? A time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, that is of Israel, 
since there never was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time, that is, the end of the tribulation, at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone found written in the book of life. Or written in the book, I'm sorry. All right, now verse 2. Here comes resurrection, see? And many of them that sleep or who have died or in the dust of the earth shall awake. They're going to be called forth in resurrection power. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. All right, now stop right there. We're going to compare Scripture with Scripture. Now come back up into the New Testament with me to John's Gospel, chapter 5. John's Gospel, chapter 5. Now remember, we're still dealing with only the believers of all the ages. We started out with the first fruits and then the main harvest, which is the rapture of the body of Christ, the greatest number of believers in human history. And now we're looking at the corners and the gleanings. Old Testament, Christ's earthly ministry, Peter in the early chapter of Acts, all those that became believers before Paul comes on the scene and announces what we call the body of Christ. All right, now Jesus is speaking in John chapter 5 during his earthly ministry. Drop up to verse 28. John 5, verse 28. Now remember what we just read in Daniel. That those who have died, some are going to be resurrected to everlasting life, and the rest are going to be resurrected to eternal contempt. All right? Marvel not, Jesus spoke. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Now that doesn't mean that everybody is going to come at the same instant, but there is coming a time when they are all going to be resurrected. And Paul gives us the clue that we saw in 1 Corinthians 15, every believer in his own order. Now the unbelievers will come out all at once because they're all in the same, they're all in the same bucket. But the believers are going to be raptured first, or the first truth first, and then the rapture, and now we're talking about the resurrection of the rest. Okay, now look at it. Verse 29. And they shall come forth, they who have done good. And you know, I always define that with faith. The people of faith who have taken God at his word. They're going to come forth unto the resurrection of life, just like Daniel said. Some are going to be resurrected to everlasting life. Jesus repeats it. Some to everlasting life. They who have done evil, who had no faith. That's the only way you can fulfill the true evil in Scripture, is to be destitute of faith. All right, so they who have done evil, destitute of faith, they will come to the resurrection of condemnation. Now, we're going to talk to them later, or about them, but we're going to stop now and just go back to Daniel and pick up the believing element. And then maybe in the next half hour, or this one if we got time, then we'll talk about the unbelievers that are going to be resurrected. Because after all, this is what we're talking about, is resurrection so that by the time we get to the onset of eternity, we've got everybody that has ever lived resurrected either to eternal doom or to eternal bliss, one or the other. Okay, <clears throat> back to Daniel 12. And many of them, verse 2, that sleep in the dust of the earth. In other words, they've died physically. Their soul hasn't. The soul is alive somewhere. But this is speaking of their body. The physical body is lying in the dust of the earth, and they shall awake. Resurrection power is going to call them out. Some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise, see, almost the same language that Jesus used in John. 
they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars. That's our hope for eternity. We're going to be something intensely unique for all eternity. All right, reading on. Verse 4. Now God comes back to the man Daniel. He says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words. Seal the book, this book of prophecy, even to the time of the end. Now you know what that means to me. From the time that these Old Testament prophets were writing, even on through Christ's earthly ministry, and on up into the church age, it wasn't until about the middle 1860s that men began to get a little bit of a grasp of end-time prophecy. It was just never mentioned, and they never taught it. They had no handle on it. And then all of a sudden, like I said, about the middle 1860s, but especially at the turn of the century, men began to envision the return of the Jew from their scattered estate amongst the nations, that yes, indeed, they would be going back to their homeland, they would once again become a nation. That was unheard of until about 1900. Well, that was the way God really intended, because it was moot. It wasn't going to happen that soon anyway. Even though the church had the doctrine of imminency, the second coming was never taught that way. The second coming had to come as prophecy unfolded, see? So you've got the same concept here, all right? That Daniel closes up this book of prophecy, and it really meant nothing until we came close to the end. All right, now reading on in verse 4. Many shall run to and fro. Well, we certainly know that. Maybe not on their feet, but they're going through the air and every other which way, but... Mankind is traveling now by the millions. And they'll run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, when I taught this verse by verse someplace in the past, we're not just talking only about technical knowledge, although that certainly is involved. My goodness, you buy a computer today, and by the end of the month, it's obsolete and uh, it's old-fashioned. Knowledge is exploding like never before in human history. <clears throat> but, as I've already mentioned, it would also be an explosion of biblical knowledge. My, we have an understanding of the scriptures now that they never even dreamed of when I was a kid. Because, for a lot of reasons, we've got technology all around us that we can see the scriptures we're alluding to. We see the nation of Israel back in her homeland, and so naturally... We have a better handle on all these things than they did two, three generations ago when God began to open up the understanding of the prophetic program. All right, now verse 5. We've got to keep moving. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood two others, the one on the side of the bank of the river and the other on the other side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, that makes me think it was either God the Son or one of the angels. And one said to the man clothed in linen, who was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders or these miracles? And I heard the man clothed in linen, who was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and left hand to heaven, and swore by him who liveth forever... That's, in other words, a, an allusion to claiming the very word of God. And this is what he proclaimed, that it shall be for a time, one year, plus times or two for a total of three and a half. And all of Scripture refers to the seven years in two half segments of three and a half and three and a half. All right? And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. In other words, brought to an end. Now verse 8. Now remember, Daniel is writing clear back there at 500 and some B.C. And by inspiration again, the Spirit leads him to write, I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? All of these prophetic statements. 
What shall be the end of these things? Now that makes me feel it had to be the Lord that he was dealing with. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words, in other words, what he's written in these 12 chapters, for the words are closed up and sealed until what? The end of time. Now again, we've got to be careful how we look at this. Even though we're dealing in terms of 100 years from 1900 to now, in the light of the 6,000 years of human history, what's 100? Well, it's just nothing. And so, yes, I think that God is looking at the very time in which we now live when he told Daniel that these things would be closed up until our day and time. All right, now look at verse 10. Many shall be purified. In other words, we're going to see salvation of probably more people than almost any time in human history. Many shall be purified and made white and tried or tested, but the wicked shall do wickedly. Is that right on? Man, I reckon. Otherwise, you're not reading the same papers that I am. Uh, it's just getting unreal. And I'm sure that the Star Tribune in Minneapolis and uh, the Chicago Tribune and all the other big city papers have got just as much of this as we do in Oklahoma. Child abuse, sexual immorality of every kind. You can imagine the papers are full of it. Murder, murder, and more murder. And what are they doing? Wickedly. All right? It's foretold. So we don't really have to be too shocked, do we? All right? And so, the wicked shall do wickedly. None of the wicked shall understand. Well, we're seeing that every day, aren't we? My, they haven't got a clue of what all this means until they find salvation and then they write and they call and say, Les, I never before saw that all the stuff I'm reading in the newspaper is coming right out of this book. It's all foretold. It's all prophesied, see? But the unbeliever can't see that. It's just beyond them. All right, reading on. Verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. Now we've got to be careful. Come back to Daniel chapter 9. I've got to do this slowly or I'm going to lose 90% of my audience. Back to Daniel chapter 9. What I always call the foundation or the benchmark of all end time prophecy where Daniel is laying out the time frame of 490 years determined upon thy people. And we know that 483 of those were fulfilled at the cross. And then when you come down to verse 27, this is what we are dealing with now in the end time. Verse 27, And he, this prince that shall come, somewhere from out of the Roman Empire, this prince that shall come will confirm, I feel, will make a covenant or a treaty with many. In other words, with the whole Arab world and Israel. Yes, they're going to finally sign a peace treaty. But I've said it on the program many, many times. The UN won't do it. The White House won't do it. Blair House won't do it. The Republicans won't do it. The Democrats won't do it. It's going to be a God thing. And miraculously... This man, Antichrist, this prince that shall come, will be able to bring the Arab world in a peace treaty with Israel, which will give Israel the peace they've been looking for, and above everything else that's most unbelievable, they're going to permit Israel to rebuild a temple. Now, it won't be the big fancy gold edifice that Solomon built, but they're going to have a temple that's going to be functional, and they're going to be able to reinstitute Judaism to the full, the animal sacrifices, the whole night. It's coming. They're all ready for it. All right, so this man, Antichrist, is going to make a treaty with many, the whole Middle East. But in the middle of the week, see, and a week is seven years. So at the end of three and a half years of peace and relative, relative tranquility in Jerusalem and that area, 
This man in his wicked role will cause the sacrifice and the oblation, which is part of Jewish sacrificial worship, to stop. Well, I always stop and ask people, can you stop something that hasn't started? Well, of course not. So we know that temple worship is going to have to be reinstituted for that first three and a half years so that the Antichrist can bring it to a stop at the middle. All right? And so in the middle of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to stop. And for the overspreading of abominations, he, the Antichrist, shall make it, that refurbished temple, temple he will cause it to be desolate or useless. And it'll remain that way even unto the consummation, that is, to the end of the three and a half years. And that or everything that has been determined or prophesied shall be poured upon this desolator, the man Antichrist. In other words, his end is going to be horrendous. All right, so that is the promise then that Daniel is standing on. Now come back to chapter 12. When Daniel gives us the time of the resurrection of all the saints that we haven't already covered, all the Old Testament believers, and everybody, I think, through the New Testament until we get to Paul, will be in this resurrection. And when's it going to take place? Verse 11. From the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, the middle of the tribulation, and the abomination that maketh death so it is set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now three and a half years is a thousand two hundred and sixty days. So we've already picked up an extra thirty days, but now go with the next verse and we get another forty five. Blessed is he that waiteth. Now remember what he's talking to. He's talking to Daniel's company of believers who are going to be resurrected. That's what he's talking about. We've got to keep that straight. All right, so blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But Daniel, he says, go thy way until the end be, until this day comes. Just don't, don't sweat it. All right, for thou shalt rest, waiting for resurrection. Thou shalt rest and stand in thy what? Your lot at the end of the days, and that will bring in the Old Testament saints. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.